everyone and welcome to the Penguin Prof channel. Today I'm going to continue my natural history series and talk about one of the most amazing of all marine animals, the killer whale or the orca. Um, orcas are mammals, of course. They're in order Cetacea. Um, their suborder refers to the fact that they have teeth. So there are two groups of cetaceans, those with teeth and those without. They're actually dolphins. They're in family Delphinidae. They are the biggest of all dolphins, um, but a lot of people are surprised to find out that, in fact, they are actually dolphins. They are found all over the world. They have a truly global distribution. They're found in almost all oceans and seas, but they do prefer high latitudes, and most of them prefer to hang out around the coast where their food supplies are. Um, some basic information about them. They're big. The males get up to 9 meters and over 4,500 kilograms. Uh, males can live up to about 60 years old. Females will live quite a bit longer. That's mainly because... Um, the males are fighting uh, for access to females, and so they tend to die younger. By the way, if you want to know the difference between a male and a female, you're going to have to swim underneath, which I don't recommend in the wild. Generally, you can tell them in the wild um, based on size. Gestation period is uh, over a year by quite a bit, 16 to 17 months. The calves are born 2 meters in length, 180 kilograms. That's a big baby. They nurse for at least a year. Other than, obviously, their appearance, which is very distinctive, it is really their social structure that makes orcas so interesting. And there are only a few other groups of animals, uh, obviously including humans, elephants, uh, some other dolphins and primates that, that have such a complex social structure. This really does get to the core of the cetaceans in captivity issue. Uh, it's not just that the enclosures are small, but it really has to do a lot more with the social structure that these animals are used to, that many of us um, have issues with. When you take these animals out of their social networks, out of their social groups, their pods and their clans, um, and force them to live in captive conditions, that's, that's what a lot of us really take issue with. Um, the thing is, to study how orcas live in the wild, you have to know individuals. And uh, cetacean biologists have always used uh, patterns on the body as well as the dorsal fin in order to recognize individuals. Um, it turns out that they're a lot like people. In order to understand how their societies work, you have to know how individuals are related to each other. Many people are surprised to know that there are three completely distinctive um, assemblages of orcas, and we refer to them as resonance, transients, and offshore groups. They are distinct in their appearance, in their diet, where we find them, and most interestingly, I think, their behavior and their social systems. So I want to take a look at all three. Residents are particularly complex. They have a very, very stable social structure. They are fish eaters. Um, they basically specialize on salmon, and the Chinook salmon here forms a majority of their diet all year round. They use a lot of echolocation um, to find their prey. They live in matriarchal matrilineal societies, so it is all about the females. Um, unlike any other mammal species that we know of, individuals live with their mothers for their entire life. Because the females live so long, like up to 90 years, um, you'll have groups with as many as four generations all living together. Um, they really rarely uh, separate from one another, maybe for a few hours. There is one recorded individual, uh, they named Luna, that was actually permanently separated from her matriline. That is the only wild orca in which that was observed. I think that's pretty incredible. Closely related matrilines will uh, form loose aggregations that we then call pods. Pods share uh, a distinct vocal pattern, and so you can identify them um, with a hydrophone. And then you have uh, pods that will be um, grouped together in larger groups uh, which still share an older maternal heritage, and we call those clans. And clans also share the same vocal pattern, and that's where it ends. Um, different clans uh, do not share the same, uh, we call it a dialect. Um, and sometimes clans will get together and commingle. We call that a community. That's probably the, the loosest 
uh, aggregation of, of individuals would be the, the community. Transient orcas uh, live a completely different lifestyle, and they eat completely different foods, and they communicate with each other in completely different ways. These are the mammal and bird eaters. Um, this is the group that really gave rise to the name killer whale. Um, they can be pretty vicious in that they are the only whales that eat other whales. Um, these societies are matrilineal, just like the residents are, but they don't stay in those big groups. The uh, offspring tend to disperse from their mothers once they reach maturity, and certainly once they have offspring of their own. They need to be in small groups because, unlike fish, um, their marine mammal prey can hear really well underwater. So they don't vocalize as much. They don't echolocate. They will vocalize during a kill or after a kill. That's about it. The offshore orcas we know almost nothing about. They spend their time far away from the coast where humans are, obviously. They uh, sometimes will come in if there are deep uh, coastal inlets, but that's about it. We don't really see them very often. They tend to be the largest groups, uh, 30 to 70 individuals um, on a regular basis. They seem to feed on sharks and large pelagic fish like halibut. Um, we base this on the rare, uh, the rare um, beachings of, of dead offshore orcas where we can actually look at their stomach contents. We also see that their teeth are really worn down, and that's actually evidence of eating sharks. Uh, sharks have very, very rough skin, so if you eat sharks, uh, your teeth tend to get worn down quite easily. They also have a lot more scars and damage, and that would also fall into um, animals that eat sharks for, uh, for prey, because sharks, as you might imagine, are not too easy to eat. Um, the video footage you're going to see was taken uh, in islands off British Columbia, and uh, specifically a place called Bamfield, which if you're interested in seeing orcas in the wild, which you definitely should, um, it's a wonderful place to go. So uh, let's take a look.
Okay, of course, um, I have to talk about captive orcas. Um, some things are obvious. You're taking an animal that in the wild lives in a huge range that swims for hundreds of miles, um, sometimes in a day, and you're putting it in a box. Uh, it, no matter how beautiful the enclosure may appear, you're putting an eagle in a, in a canary cage. You have to have walls in captivity, obviously, and walls are something that pelagic animals don't encounter. So orcas in the wild obviously have never seen a wall before, so of course their behavior is going to change dramatically. Probably even more significant than the size of the box that you put it in is the fact that individuals are completely separated from their pods and clans. And that seems to lead to a lot of anxiety on the part of the individuals who, you know, normally under normal conditions would never be separated from their uh, matrilineal groups. Uh, in captivity, they have a very limited and unvaried diet. Um, the fish has to be frozen in order to kill microbes, but then has to be supplemented with vitamins and minerals because uh, freezing destroys uh, many of those micronutrients. And the water that the animals live in has to be chlorinated, has to be treated so that algae and fungi don't grow on the skin. Normally that's never a problem because the animals are swimming at such a speed in the wild that uh, there's never a chance for algae, for example, or barnacles uh, to settle on them. Um, this is a typical orca pen. This was from SeaWorld in San Diego. And um, there's no doubt about it that SeaWorld certainly has been a leader in making uh, habitats that are less confining um, than some of the old style circular tanks of the past. But the bottom line is for an animal that has an enormous home range, there is no way you're going to be able to keep it in captivity in any way that similar to what it would have in the wild. It's just too big of an animal. Um, you notice the classic curved dorsal fin that the males will often exhibit. Um, this has been studied extensively. There's a, a SeaWorld trainer on the left that's measuring the, the bending of the dorsal fin of a captive whale. Um, in the wild, less than 1% of uh, male orcas show any degree of dorsal fin bending. Um, this is mainly just physics. It's because of the speed at which they travel. If an animal swims in a circle in a tank, uh, the sheer force, the weight of the fin constantly uh, moving in one direction, in a, you know, whether clockwise or counterclockwise, um, the dorsal fin is going to bend over. There's no bone supporting it. That is a cartilaginous structure. Certainly, uh, trainer deaths always make the news, and uh, this one probably was one of the more famous um, from 2010 was very dramatic. Don was a very, very well-respected, experienced trainer who had spent her life uh, working with orcas, and her loss was is very significant. I do believe that uh, Jacques Cousteau said it best. I support wild and free orcas, and I hope that you will too. You can visit keepwhaleswild.org for more information. As always, thank you so much for visiting the Penguin Prof channel. Please visit on Facebook and follow on Twitter.